pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word this morning. Bright may it be to us, shining and illuminating may it be inside of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Matthew 25 and verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, in our last study in this chapter, we looked at the parable of the talents, and we saw how there were these three servants, and how each, servant, each of those three servants received some talents. Some were five, one was five, one was, was two, one was one. But the point is, is that each one received something. Five, two, one. And then we saw how the man, how the Lord of this house, uh, uh, the, 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 had given, as we said, these talents. But the man who got the five talents, we saw how he took them and he used them in trade and got five other talents. Very good. And he was happy. He was a very happy man to come and to present the ten talents to his Lord who returned and he was commended for that in verse 21 with the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And then we saw how the man who received two talents, he also took them, went out, did, some, did business, trading, and he got two more talents. And he also was rewarded in the same way. But then the focus in that uh, parable turned to the man who had received one talent and did absolutely nothing with it. And he was stripped of his talent and he was, told, he was called, he was given a title in verse 26 of thou wicked and slothful servant and his judgment was, surprisingly, in verse 30, cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This judgment of casting the slothful servant who did nothing into hell prompts a question, a very basic question, well, what exactly does it mean to be a Christian? What is, who is a Christian? This is the most misunderstood question today, especially in the church. A true Christian is a person who has surrendered his life to Jesus Christ to serve Christ to the best of his ability. Well, he's got ability of 10 talents, he's got ability of two talents, the best of his ability. The two who received, the, ta the, the, the first two who received the five talents and the two talents, each of them got right to work and they were able to present to their Lord double the money that they were entrusted with. Very good. And those two men were rewarded with heaven as their Lord said unto them in, in verse 23, in verse 23, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. But the man who received one talent and did nothing with it, he did, he, he did not get to, to work for his Lord, so that at the end he had no gains to present to his Lord. This man was cast into hell, and the Lord said, uh, cast this unprofitable servant into outer darkness, and where there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth, in verse 30. So from this parable of the talents, there are three very clear points that we can gain from this parable. First, 
just as all men here in this parable receive some talents, the first point is everyone who comes to Jesus Christ has received, has some abilities that have been given to him and has a command from Christ to work, work for Christ. There's not one person today who's come to Jesus Christ that, that, that Christ has not told in, in, in Matthew 20, verse 1, Matthew 20, verse 1, the kingdom of heaven is as like unto a man that's a householder that went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. In, in Matthew 20, verse 7, Matthew 20, verse 7, where he said, go ye also into the vineyard. In John 1, 4, John 1, 4, where Christ said, the night cometh when no man can work. So this term, full-time Christian service, is very misleading. It's very misleading because it implies that there are some Christians who work for Christ and some Christians who do not work for Christ. That's not true. That's not true. Christ expects every person who comes to him to be in full-time Christian service. Most, uh, most work for Christ behind enemy lines, so to speak, in the workplace or socializing with the lost. And they are working behind enemy lines because they're not wearing a uniform of a pastor or a missionary. They're not, they don't say, I'm pastor so-and-so. I am a missionary. But they are, they, they, they are in the workplace, and so because they don't have the uniform of a pastor and a missionary, they're working as spies, if you want, behind enemy lines. But Christ has told every person who comes to him to work for him, and Christ has given every person who comes to him abilities to work for Christ. And just as every person in this parable was expected to work for his Lord, that's the first point in the parable. Everyone who comes to Christ has been ordained by Christ to, to use his life, to use his abilities for Christ, the ones that he's given him, and to look forward to the day when he will appear before Christ and be able to present to Christ the gains, the results, the accomplishments of his life work for Christ. That's the first point. The second point of this parable is that it doesn't matter how much fruit, how large the gains that, re, that resulted from a life that was doing its best to work for Christ. The reward is the same. The reward is the same. Both of the servants who made gains for the Lord received the same reward. They both were told the same thing in verse 21 and verse 23, exactly the same thing. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Exactly the same. And yet one person had received more, had gained more than double the amount of the other person. He had five talents to present to the Lord, where the other one had two talents, but the reward was the same. This is the second point of this parable of the talents. It doesn't matter. If you are a Billy Graham, using your God-given abilities for reaching hundreds of millions of Gentiles and seeing millions of Gentiles respond to the gospel, or if you're using, to the best of your ability, your God-given abilities for reaching Jews, and never seeing one come to Christ. Rewards are the same. Rewards are the same. Very encouraging for me. Anyway, this is the second point of this parable. The rewards are the same regardless of the amount of the results as long as a person uses all of his God-given abilities to serve Christ. It's as the hymn puts it so well. Give of your best to the master. Give of the strength of your youth. Throw your soul's fresh, glowing ardor into the battle for truth. Jesus has set the example. Dauntless was he, young and brave. Give him your loyal devotion. 
Give him the best you have. The last point of this parable of the talents is seen in this third man, this third man who received the one talent from his Lord and did absolutely nothing. He didn't care that he was given this one talent and it was to be used for his Lord. He just went on his life and just, he lived for himself. He didn't live for Christ. He lived for himself. He went, he, he said, oh, I'll bury it. And anyway, consequently, he had in the end nothing to present to his Lord. And the fact that this person was cast into hell teaches us that the biblical definition of a Christian or the biblical definition of a person who goes to heaven is the person who uses his life and his abilities that God has given to him to serve Jesus Christ. And that person throughout his life is working towards and looking forward to, at the end of his life, presenting to Christ the gains that he has made for Christ in his lifetime. Those are the three points that this parable of the talents is bringing. First, everyone has received abilities from Christ. Everyone who comes to Christ has been told to get to work with his life for Christ, use his life to serve Christ. Second, everyone who has used his life to work for Christ is rewarded with the same reward, regardless of how much gain he made for Christ as long as he did his best. Third, a person who has not dedicated his life to working for Christ and is not living and looking forward to, at the end of his life, reporting to Christ on what he accomplished for Christ is cast into hell. So the end of the parable of the, of, of the, of this ta- the parable of the talents, the end of this is judgment. It's judgment of a life that was lived for Christ or not lived for Christ, And this brings Christ now to the transition of the subject of judgment in the verse 31. Verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. So we've been studying here in this chapter two parables. The parables first of the ten virgins, and then the parable of of the talents. And now, as we come to verse 31, Christ is giving an explanation. Looking back on those two parables, he's giving an explanation of the meaning of these two parables. And the explanation is judgment. It's judgment. That's what this is all about. And so then Christ now starts this this subject of judgment uh, uh, in verse 31 with the word when in verse 31. Very important word. Verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come. It's not a question of if the Son of Man, it's not a if Christ is going to come. It's only a question of when. Christ has already told us in, the, in this last chapter that, that in, in the chapter before, chapter 24, he's already told us no one knows exactly when this coming is going to be of Christ, but it's for sure he will come. There's no question about it. And so he's making it clear that a great day of judgment is coming in in which everyone is going to be judged and sentenced to a state of either everlasting happiness or everlasting misery. It's going to happen. And then Christ describes himself in several several titles. And and as the judge here, he describes himself. And the first title that he describes himself as the judge is the title of Son of Man. He is the judge with the title of Son of Man in verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come. God has committed all, God the Father has committed all judgment to Jesus Christ in John 5.22. John 5.22, he said, The Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. And there is Right now, just think of it, right now, there is a day set. This day is already set. It's already on the calendar when Christ will judge all people as a man. He will judge all people as a man. Acts 17, 31, Acts 17, 31. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness 
by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Christ as a man will judge all people. Christ will judge people as the Son of Man. And, and that means that a person being judged will not be able to say, well, you're God. You're God. I'm a man. You don't understand what it's like to be under the temptation of sin. You have no idea what it was like for me as a man to live in this world and be tempted and to be uh, tempted by the devil. And no, no one will be able to say that because they'll be standing before the Son of Man. They'll be standing before Christ the man. And the judge will be Christ as the Son of Man who has the same nature as a man because he is a man, but, with, but he doesn't have the sin nature. So no one will be able to say that be Christ, be, no one will be able to say because Christ will appear as a man that, that the Son of Man who was not a person, you're not a person, no one will be able to say, well, you are not a person as Hebrews 4.15, Hebrews 4.15, you are not a person who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. No, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Christ is the Son of Man, from Isaiah 53.3, Isaiah 53.3, Christ is the Son of Man, he was despised. He was rejected of men. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Christ is the Son of Man. He experienced more sorrow as a man than any other man ever had. In Lamentations 1.12, Lamentations 1.12, he says, Is it nothing for you? Is it nothing to you? All ye that pass by, just think of him on the cross at this point. Think of him on the cross having these thoughts in his mind on the cross of Lamentations 1.12, Lamentations 1.12, and the people are passing in front of the cross and they say, oh, look at him, as they go by. And he's saying in his mind, Lamentations 1.12, is it nothing to you, all you that pass by? Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. He, the wrath of God fell on him on that cross and caused him to be in such a deep sorrow that when the people were walking by like a carnival, like an like a, like a, like a, 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 a entertainment, and they saw him, he says to them, is it nothing to you? Is it nothing to you, all you that pass by and see if there's any sorrow like unto my sorrow, this is the man of sorrows. This is the man of sorrows. And when he does appear as the son of man, what will be seen in him are the print of the nails in his hands. They'll be seen. And that sight will be so condemning to, to the lost because they'll realize he could have, he could have been my savior. He could have been my atonement for my sin, but I rejected him, Christ, as my Savior. Just the sight of Christ as the Son of Man, as the judge, with the nail scars in his hands, will speak so loudly of, of, of how humble he was when he, in his condescension, when he went down and he died for our sins. And, Philippians 2.7, Philippians 2.7, when he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So Christ is explaining in verse 31 that when he comes, that he'll come as the Son of Man but he'll come in his glory, in his glory. And Christ's glory has a radiance to it, which a couple of the disciples saw on the Mount of Transfiguration, but that's gonna, th this is going to be different now because now he's going to be seen, as he says in verse 31, that he's going to come in his glory. And what is that glory? That glory is equivalent or the same 
as God the Father's glory. The, 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 the amount of lumens in his glory, the brightness of his glory is the same as it says in Hebrews 1, 3, Hebrews 1, 3, 1, 3, 1, Hebrews 1, 3. Who being the brightness, that's the number of lumens, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Just think about it. There were three crosses where he was crucified. But, and, and, and the three crosses we know, the one cross of the one thief who rejected Christ and then the other cross of the other thief who rejected Christ, that was a statement that says that everybody falls into the category of one of those two thieves, either the receiver or the rejecter. But standing in the middle is Jesus Christ alone when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. In other words, he was all alone when he was doing all this. And then in verse 31, Christ said that he will not come alone. He won't be coming alone when he comes. He was on the cross alone. But when he comes in judgment, he says he won't be alone. All the angels will be coming with him. There's not one angel that's going to say on that morning, you know, I don't feel very good. I'd like to sleep in this morning. Not one angel. Not one angel is going to say, can I be excused from this coming? All the angels, verse 31, verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him. That means there's not going to be one angel who won't be coming with Christ when when he comes. And, 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 And those angels will come and they all have specific key roles to perform at that time of judgment. They all got a job. The angels, for example, will, when they come, will be, will be charged with, they have the job of gathering every saved person from every corner of the earth. It doesn't matter if they died in in Alaska, or they died in Tonga, or they died in, 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 in Ethiopia. Matthew, in verse 31, verse 31, he shall send his angels, sorry, Matthew 24, 31, Matthew 24, 31. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So there's going to be a signal. There's going to be a signal that the angels are waiting for. You can just see them saying to themselves, wait for the signal. Don't move till you hear the signal. And that signal is is a shout. It's a shout from one angel called the archangel, and there will be a loud trumpet sound called the trump of God, and we angels are waiting for that, and they don't launch into their, their action until they hear that, and then when they, when they hear that, then those angels will get right to work, and they'll bring out of every grave followers of Christ called the dead in Christ. And, and the angels are, are going to do that according to 1 Thessalonians 4.16. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So, and when Christ comes as a judge, the angels then, they're going to gather together all those also who rejected Christ. They're going to have a second gathering of all those who rejected Christ, and they're going to bring them to judgment, and then after judgment, it's going to be those same angels that are going to cast those unregenerate into the lake of fire. Hebrews 9.27, Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And man may say, but I don't want to stand before God in judgment. And the angels will say, we don't care. It, 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 because it'll be the angels that'll bring the people, whether they want to or not, to stand in judgment. And if a person has turned his back on God in his life, then it'll be the angels that will carry out that judgment of Matthew 13:40. Matthew 13:40. 40. 
As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. And it'll be the angels, it'll be the angels that will be the witnesses. They will sit there and watch the misery and the suffering of the lost in hell. They will see that. Revelation 14.10, Revelation 14.10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night. Then after Christ comes in his glory with all the angels in verse 31, Christ tells us that he will sit on the throne of his glory. Now Christ is sitting not on that throne. Christ is sitting on another throne. He's on the right hand of God the Father. He's sitting on a different throne. And God the Father, because God the Father said to Christ that he should sit now in wait, in waiting. He's waiting now in this, in this throne he's sitting on until his enemies are made his footstool, what he puts his feet on in, in Psalm 110, verse 1. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So now Christ is sitting on the throne, and for us, the throne that Christ is sitting on has a name, and the name is the throne of grace. He's sitting on the throne of grace, and we are told that we should right now be coming boldly to that throne of grace so that we can get help in our needs. Hebrews 4.15, Hebrews 4.15. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So the, the throne now that Christ is now sitting on is the, is the throne of a priest. He's sitting on the throne of a priest, a, 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 not just any priest, a high priest that can be touched with the feeling of our weaknesses. And this priest's throne that Christ is sitting on now, we are to come boldly today is, is, to, is called the throne of grace. But when Christ comes in verse 31, he'll sit on a different throne, and that throne is called the throne of his glory in verse 31. Verse 31, then shall he sit on the throne of his glory. And the prophet, it was the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament, that described in even more detail than we have right here what that will look like when Christ sits on that throne of his glory. And when Daniel called Christ at that time, he didn't call him the Son of Man, but he called him the Ancient of Days. His title is the Ancient of Days in Daniel 7, verse 9. Daniel 7, verse 9, he said, Daniel, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and his hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. Those thousand thousands that ministered to Christ, those are the angels. Those are all the holy angels, all the holy angels that Christ said would come with him in verse 31. Those 10,000 times 10,000 that are standing before Christ, those are people. Those are people there that are standing there for judgment. And the books that Daniel said were open, that they're being judged out of, those are the same books in Revelation 20, verse 12. Revelation 20, verse 12, where John said, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. 
and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. 10,000 times 10,000, Daniel said. And those are the ones that are described in verse 32, in Matthew 25, 32, verse 32. And before him shall be gathered all nations. That will be every person from every age of the world from the beginning of time, from Adam right unto the last person who was born on the earth from the most remote parts of the earth, from the most distant places, all people that God says are, by the way, all one blood, one blood in Acts 17, 26. It doesn't matter if it's a man whose skin is jet black or a man whose skin is brown or a man who, whose skin is white or whatever. It doesn't matter. All one blood, God says, Acts 17, 26, Acts 17, 26, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. And so when they're all gathered together, then Christ will do his great work of separation. Separation. He's going to, that's the key word there in, 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 in verse 32. The, the shepherd shall separate. Christ is going to separate one from another just like a farmer separates the wheat from the chaff, which are all mixed together and start. Mac, John the Baptist, Matthew 3.11, Matthew 3.11, Math, John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather the wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That's how the farmer separates the wheat from the chaff. The farmer throws the wheat up in the air, and the, the wheat and the chaff together, they go up in the air, and, and then he uses a fan, he uses a fan to, to, to create the wind, which will blow the lighter chaff away from the, from the wheat. This separation in verse 32 that Christ is referring to is also described in a parable when he said in Matthew 13, 24, Matthew 13, 24, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field, but while man slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it these tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather you together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. The farmer's separation of this wheat from the tares is exactly what King David was referring to in, in the first Psalm, in Psalm 1, verse 4. Psalm 1, verse 4. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. So this separation that Christ is speaking of here when the shepherd separates in verse 32, verse 32, is the same as the separation of the fishermen. The fishermen, you know, uh, you know I, uh, when I go fishing and, and I get a fish on the line, I don't know what kind of fish it is. He's on the line, but I know he's there because he's practically ripping the rod out of my hand. And, and, I, and, and so uh, I struggle and I reel and I reel and I reel. And sometimes the fish, normally, the fish gets uh, several bursts of energy and makes a run for it. And the drag on the reel lets the fish run, and the clicker just wheels away with the clicking noise. But then the, finally the fish tires, and I reel and reel and reel, and we repeat this several times. And all the while, I have no idea. 
I have no idea what kind of fish it is on the line. I, I, I think I know a little bit because I've gotten to know some of their struggling patterns, but the struggle can go on. It can go on for, it can go on for a minute, and go on for five minutes, and go on for 15 minutes until finally the fish tires. Actually, it's always a question, and I always say to the fish, which one's gonna tire first, me or you? But, you know, finally, I'm, uh, he tires out, and I'm able to bring him up, and when he gets within about eight feet of the water, and if there's other people in the boat, they all say the same thing. I see color, I see color, which means that we can see the fish, and then we can see what kind of fish it is, and I, see, and I, and I look at it, and I, I have, a, I have a, 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 a laminated sheet where I have a picture of all the good fish to eat. And, and, and if it's not one of those good fish to eat, then it's a bad fish not to be eaten. And so the good fish, I keep the good fish, and the bad fish, and they're not good, well, I throw it away. That's the separation between the good and the bad. Or, uh, 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 and, and, or the separation can be seen in the fishermen in Christ's day who didn't use hook and line like that, but they used nets. And what they did is they, they, they dragged the nets onto the shore. And then the fishermen would sit on the shore with that, with that net there and with all the fish in his net. And he would do the separation process. You say, good, you keep, bad, you go away. And, and, and Christ talked about this in Matthew 13, 47. Matthew 13, 47, when he said, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels and but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, in verse 32, verse 32 here, verse 32, Christ said that he would be the one. He's the one who's going to do this separation one from another. Notice that in verse 32. When he shall, verse 32, when he shall, when he shall, he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. So what's clear here is that Christ spent a lot of time in all of these uh, parables and explanations. He's given us, a, he's taken a lot of time to, 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 to tell us about the separation process that he's going to do. He's taken a lot of time to do that. And notice that Christ says that he's the shepherd. He is the shepherd, and when he describes the sheep, he calls the sheep his sheep in verse 32. Verse 32. His sheep. But when Christ describes the goats, Christ does not call the goats his goats. He doesn't do that. No, no, no. Christ calls the goats the goats, but he calls the sheep his sheep. Why? Because the sheep are Christ's sheep. They're Christ's sheep, and he's the shepherd. Just as David said in Psalm 23, 1, Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Just as David said in Psalm 95, verse 7, Psalm 95, verse 7, For he is our God, and we are the people of, the past, of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Just as David said in Psalm 100, verse 3, Psalm 100, verse 3, Know ye that the Lord, he is God? It is he that hath made us, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. David said, the Lord is my shepherd, and we are the sheep of his pasture. Christ is not the shepherd of everyone. He's not. Not everyone is a sheep of Christ. The most important question that a person can ask in this short testing time that we call a lifetime, relatively short, the most important question that any person can ask is, is Christ really my shepherd? Is he really my shepherd? Am I really a sheep of Christ? Am I really? No one is born with Christ as their shepherd. No, there's not one person 
that's born that, that, that it can be said about that little baby, Christ is a shepherd. No, no one is born a sheep of Christ. No little baby is a sheep of Christ. When Christ told Nicodemus in John 3, 7, John 3, 7, marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. That's really a mistranslation. It's sad. It's so, you have to be, you must be born again. It's wrong because but it doesn't say born again. Literally, the Greek reads born from above, born from above. Christ told Nicodemus, you must be born from above. Christ told Nicodemus, you need a new birth that happens someplace else. It happens above you, outside of your natural birth. It's a spiritual birth. And that new birth from above is when Christ becomes a person's shepherd. You must, what Christ was telling Nicodemus, you must have me as your shepherd. What Christ was telling Nicodemus was, you must become one of my sheep. That's what he meant. And that new birth that's from above is when a person becomes one of Christ's sheep. And God makes that new birth to happen from above when a person, say, when a person is really sorry for his sins and tells God that he's sorry for his sins. And the proof that a person is really sorry for his sins is when the person stops those sins that he's sorry for. And when that person gives himself 100% to Jesus Christ and makes a life commitment that he follows through on to follow Christ and serve Christ, that's when God makes that person to be born from above. And that's when that person becomes one of Christ's sheep, and that's when, that, when Christ becomes that person's shepherd, and Christ becomes that person's God. Many people today, many people today think they are Christ's sheep. Many people today think that Christ is their shepherd and God. Many people, when they're in trouble, in deep trouble, will recite the 23rd Psalm when their knees are shaking, and they'll say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Many people, when they're in trouble, will call out, oh my God, oh my God. But the question is, really? Is Christ really their shepherd? Are they really one of Christ's sheep? Is Christ really their God? And we cannot tell. We cannot tell who is really one of Christ's sheep. Judas Iscariot was one of the disciples. Judas Iscariot was the disciple that they all trusted to handle the money, to be the treasurer. And when Christ said that at the Last Supper that one of the disciples was not really one of his sheep, that one of the disciples, he was not really a shepherd, none of the disciples, none of them suspected it was Judas Iscariot. And the disciples all be at, began to ask Christ, is it me? Is it me? Are you talking about me? Matthew 26, 21, Matthew 26, 21. As they, as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? Now one of the disciples said, I know who it is. It's Judas Iscariot. Not one of the disciples. Why? Because Judas Iscariot, he had obeyed Christ in preaching the gospel. Judas Iscariot had obeyed Christ in healing the sick. Judas Iscariot had done many wonderful works, but Judas Iscariot was secretly not one of Christ's sheep, and none of the disciples knew it. Who knew that, Jesus, that, that Judas Iscariot was really not one of Christ's sheep? Only Christ and Judas Iscariot. That's why it's so important to see in verse 32, verse 32, he shall separate them one from another. Only Christ can do this separation between the real sheep of Christ and the seeming or apparent sheep of Christ. And how can Christ do this? Because of 2 Timothy 2.19, 2 Timothy 2.19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. 
and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. We look at others, we can't tell who really belongs to Christ, just like the disciples looked at Judas Iscariot. They couldn't tell that Judas Iscariot didn't really belong to Christ. We cannot tell, but Christ, as the shepherd, he knows who is really his sheep because of 2 Timothy 2.19, 2 Timothy 2.19. The Lord knoweth them that are his. So that brings the question, well, how can a person know if he really is one of Christ's sheep and if Christ really is his shepherd? Ah, that's where the second part of 2 Timothy 2.19 comes in. 2 Timothy 2.19, which says, And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Judas Iscariot knew that he was pocketing the cash. He was slipping money into his own pocket. He knew that. The other disciples didn't know that. There was a hole in the bag, and that hole went right into Judas's pocket. But Judas knew it. And Judas knew that he was not. He was naming the name of Christ, but he was not departing from iniquity. If a person is really one of Christ's sheep, he'll know it. He'll know it because he's not departing from iniquity. And, and not only, but Christ said about knowing, John 10, 14, John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine, he said, the two sides. A person can have assurance that he's one of Christ's sheep. He does not have to live his life saying, am I saved or I'm not saved? I really don't know. Am I Christ's sheep or not? I don't know. Is he my shepherd or not? I don't know. No. A person can have assurance that he is one of Christ's sheep and Christ is really his shepherd if he looks at his life and it's characterized by a continual departure from sin. When a person becomes one of Christ's sheep and Christ is really that person's shepherd, then Christ comes to live inside that person. And Christ living inside that person as his shepherd will lead that person to walk more and more away from his sin. That person will have an enhanced sensitivity to his own sin. 1 John 1.18, 1 John 1.18. 1 John 1.18. 1 1 1 if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth's not in us. That person will be continually confessing his sin to Christ in order to be cleansed by the blood of Christ and in order for him more to divorce himself from his sin, abandon, walk away, forsake. 1 John 1.9, 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That person will have a growing distaste for his sinful thoughts. It's his sinful thoughts that he's going to become more and more repulsed by, made to vomit over. Proverbs 24.9, Proverbs 24.9. The thought of foolishness is sin. Mark 7.21, Mark 7.21. For, for from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murder, sex, sex, murder. Isaiah 55, 7, Isaiah 55, 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, walk away, divorce, abandon, I'm done with. Let the wicked forsake his sin and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. That person will forsake his sin more and more a way of life. And not only will Christ identify and separate out those people who say they are Christ and are not, Christ will separate out those people who say that Christ is their shepherd when he's not. But Christ will also identify and gather in every sheep that really is his. Christ will identify and gather in every person to whom he really is their shepherd. Not one of Christ's sheep will be lost in the crowd. 
Christ said in John 6, 39, John 6, 39, This is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And Christ said that he would do this with his own sheep, that he identifies and he isolates in verse 33, verse 33, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand. Christ said that he would set his own sheep on his right hand. Those sheep of Christ that he puts on his right hand are the same persons that again the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament said would wake up from their death to a state of what Daniel called everlasting life. And the goats that Christ puts on his left hands are the ones that Daniel said would wake up from their death into an eternal state of shame and everlasting contempt. Daniel 12.2, Daniel 12.2. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, when Christ said that he would set those on his right hand to go into this state of everlasting life, ever, eternal happiness, Christ did not say that he would set the rich on his right hand and the poor on his left. He did not say that he would set the educated intellects on his right hand and the ignorant and the despised on his left hand. He did not say that he would set the religious on his right hand and the non-religious on his left. He did not say that he would set Catholics on his right hand and non-Catholics on his left. He didn't say he would set Baptists on his right hand and non-Baptists on his left. He said that he would set his sheep on his right hand and those, were, and, and those that were not his sheep on his left. Clearly, the most important question for any person to ask in life, like we said, am I really one of Christ's sheep or not? Am I, is Christ really my shepherd or not? It's not a question of am I religious or not. It's not a question of am I a Catholic or not. It's not a question of am I a Baptist or not. It's not a question of do I regularly attend church or not. It's not a question is my life filled with good works for God or not. It's not a question do other people consider me a Christian or not. It's a question of what Christ said in John 10, 14, John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. It's a question, will Christ say that I am really his sheep? It's a question of, do I really know Christ as the shepherd of my life? Is my life under the constant direction of Christ as my shepherd? Am I responding to Christ as a sheep responds to the shepherd? Am I constantly listening to and hearing and obeying the voice of Christ as my life is being guided by the shepherd in his Bible? Am I listening to and obeying corrections that Christ as my shepherd is giving to me in the Bible when Christ says to me, you're going the wrong way. Don't do that. Change course. Go this way. Is my love for Christ as my shepherd growing as I long to know him more and is he becoming sweeter to me as the days go by. Because the worst self-deception that a person can be trapped in is the self-deception where he thinks that he really is one of Christ's sheep when he's not. When he thinks that Christ really is a shepherd when Christ is really not a shepherd. And this was the fatal self-deception that many, Christ said, would say in Matthew 7, 21, Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied or preached in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. May each one of us know and be sure that Christ would say, you're one of my sheep, I know you. Now in verse 34, in ver verse 34, we see Christ turn to his followers who are his sheep on the right hand of him and he speaks to them. He speaks to them and he has a special title that's used to them. 
in verse 34, verse 34, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He speaks to them as their king. This is how his sheep have known him for all their lives. He is their king. His sheep have known Christ as their king who rules over them. Reminds me, this reminds me of when Trump was president and there was this sharp divide in the country, there still is, where some people said, Trump is my president, and other people said, Trump is not my president. What was meant by saying that Trump was not or Trump was, was their president? It was whether, would Trump be respected as their president? Would Trump be listened to as their president? Would Trump be loved as their president? Would Trump be obeyed as their president? Would Trump be admired as their president? The same is true for Christ. Whether those are Christ's sheep or not, respect, it all comes down to, is, is there respect for Christ as their personal king? Is there a listening to Christ as their personal king? Is there a love for Christ as their personal king? Is there an obedience to Christ as their personal king? Is there an admiration to Christ as their personal king? But most of all, is Christ worshipped as their personal king? Especially as they see Christ on the cross dying for their sins with that title over his head in Matthew 27, 37. Matthew 23, 27, 37. Set up over his head his accusation written, this is Jesus, the king of of the Jews. And the difference between those who are Christ's sheep is that when they see that sign over Christ on the cross, they say, they, they, they say or they do not say, yes, Christ on that cross, dying for my sins, he's my king. And this is the impact of the statement in verse 34, verse 34, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, now, what does he say unto them? He turns, he speaks, he speaks his first word, this first word, one word to those of the sheep on his right hand. And that one word further tells the difference between the saved and the lost. And that one word is in verse 34, verse 34, come. He says, come. Christ says, come to his own sheep. Come. He says to his sheep on his right hand, he says, come. In verse 34. But, in verse, 30, verse 41, in verse 41, by contrast, the opposite, he says, depart. He says to those on his left hand, depart. It's come versus depart. That's what it is. Come. The sheep hear him say to them. They come. Why do they come? Because they've already come. They've already heard Christ say in their lives, come. And they came when they heard Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, when he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. They were thirsty in their lives. They were very thirsty. And they heard God say to them, Isaiah 55, 1, Isaiah 55, 1, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. They were thirsty in their lives, and they heard Christ say in John 7, 37, John 7, 37, in that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And because they came to Christ in their lives, they heard Christ say to them, come, and they joined Christ, and they, and they did that in their lives. And not only did they come to Christ, but that word come became a byword for them. It became a word that was on their mouth, and that was the word that they said to the lost in their lives. Come, come, come to Christ. And that's the picture we see of them in Revelation 22, 17. Revelation 22, 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst, come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. And just as Christ will say to the saved on his right hand in verse 34, verse 34, come, 
And they'll come because they already came to Christ in their lives. Because they said to Christ for all of their lives, they said, they, 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 they said I'm coming because Christ said to them, come to me. And now the final judgment, just to repeat, in verse 34 when Christ says come. So Christ will say to the, to the lost in verse 41, depart. And they will depart. Why? Because that's what they said to Christ during their lives. They said all throughout their lives, depart. When Christians came to the lost and started to really speak to them about coming to Christ, they said to the Christians, enough already with all this religion. Depart from me, Christian. And on those rare occasions when they might have been in church and the preacher started to say, you must repent of your sins and receive Christ now as your Savior, they said, I'm getting out of here as fast as I can and not coming back. Depart from me, preacher of Christ. And because all their lives they said to Christ, depart, then in the final judgment, Christ says to them in verse 41, depart. And when Christ says to the saved on his right hand, come, in verse 34, Christ means, come into my arms. Come into my arms. Come into my embrace. Come close to my heart. And that will be just as the hymn puts it, that great hymn, How Great Thou Art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. And then he tells the sheep on his right hand that they're blessed of his father. Blessed by God the Father. In verse 34. Verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father. The great blessings that the sheep have, have been, has already been planned. It's a long plan that, Christ, that, that the father did because it was God the Father who, 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 that wants us, as Christ said in Luke 12, 32, Luke 12, 32, fear not, little flock, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. To give us the kingdom, that wasn't an afterthought of God the Father. It was his idea from the beginning. To give us the kingdom was not done grudgingly by God the Father like, I guess I got to. It was a joy and it was his pleasure. It was his pleasure because because Christians have been in the world, 1 Corinthians 4.13, 1 Corinthians 4.13, defamed, made as the filth of the world, off-scouring all things of this day. Christians have been cursed by the world, but God the Father says, no, you're blessed. And then Christ tells the sheep to go and inherit the kingdom. He doesn't say, you deserve it, because it's not a question of deserving the kingdom. They don't receive the kingdom because they deserve it. They receive the kingdom because they inherit it. A person doesn't receive an inheritance because he deserves it. A person receives an inheritance because he was born into the family as a son. And when we were born from above, we became sons of God. John 1.12, John 1.12, As many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And sons receive an inheritance. That's what happens, Galatians 3.29. Galatians 3.29, if ye be Christ, then are your Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Romans 8.17, Romans 8.17, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Titus 3.7, Titus 3.7, being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Receiving Christ, becoming a sheep, made us children of God. And that made us heirs of the inheritance of the kingdom. Becoming a child of God made us to suffer the reproach of Christ. 1 Peter 4.14, Peter, 1 Peter 4.14, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Happy. And Christ said in Matthew 5.10, Matthew 5.10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being so great. How great thou art. In Jesus' name, amen.